So today we're starting that new test. Um, question number one. While en route to a call for a patient in cardiac arrest, you approach a stopped school bus with its red warning lights flashing. What should you do? To answer this question, you just basically have to understand the legal limits of what you're allowed to do when you're uh, driving an ambulance. If a school bus has its red warning lights flashing and you're in a regular car, um, what are you required to do? Stop. You're required to stop, right, until the little sign goes back in and all the kids are safely away. And the reason for that is because the kids are getting out of the bus and potentially crossing the street or behaving erratically like kids tend to do. Um, you can't assume that they're going to just go where you would think they're going to go. That's why the sign stays out there and you have to watch really carefully. Um, if you have an, a patient in the ambulance and the patient is in cardiac arrest, and you see the little warning light thing, do you think you have to stop? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, you still have to stop because if you continue to go through, remember, the bus driver is expecting people to stop, the kids are expecting people to stop, the kids aren't even paying attention, they're just wandering. Like I said, kids do what kids do. You have to be the person who's watching out for them. So to drive through would be incredibly unsafe at that point. Um, even though you've got a patient that's sitting in the back with cardiac arrest, um, they're going to last for the 30 seconds that it takes for you to stop, wait for the bus to go, and then you can probably move past the bus or at least continue on. Uh, versus if you try to move forward when nobody's expecting you to move forward, you might actually hit somebody. So looking at the answer choices here, mm -hmm. the best choice, yeah, is D. Um, nothing else is really that big of a deal. Nothing else is correct. Stopping isn't going to waste much time. So you have to stop. Number two. You respond to a motor vehicle crash involving a small car versus a tree. When you arrive, you find the patient, a 39-year-old male, still seated in his vehicle. He is conscious and alert and is complaining of neck pain. He does not have any immediately life-threatening injuries. What should you do? So let's look at the answer choices. A. Obtain vital signs, administer oxygen, and then extricate him from the car. Not necessarily anything wrong with this answer. Um, except maybe that it has vital signs up at the beginning instead of probably farther down in terms of priority. B, apply a cervical collar and remove him from the car on a long backboard. Now, your patient is conscious and alert and stable. In other words, no life-threatening no life threatening injuries. Um, he's doing what he's supposed to be able to do. So because he's stable, conscious, alert... Um, a long backboard actually isn't the best way to remove them. You want to go ahead and use the short style backboard. Remember the vest? You'll sometimes see it as a short backboard or a vest device. They usually won't actually say KED on the test. You're going to have to know what their little synonyms are. Um, so B wouldn't be the best answer because that long backboard's not necessary. C, rapidly extricate him from the car and perform a rapid trauma assessment. When do we do a rapid extrication? When when there's scene hazards, yeah. When it would be unsafe to stay in the car for any longer than you have to. Whether the car's on fire um, or something else is going on, if you can't stay in the car and spend the time that you need to and you have to move him quickly, you kind of have to just stabilize as best you can, grab him by his clothes and just pull him out of the car um, as safely but quickly as possible. So, because the patient is conscious and stable and just our standard of care is actually to use a shortboard or a vest style device. Um, so that's why in this case the answer is D. Immobilize his spine with a short backboard and remove him from the car. It's not that A and B would actually be wrong things to do. Um, they're not going to hurt your patient any, but they're not the best in terms of what we do as far as standard of care, just the way we would behave in this situation. So be aware of that if you have a question like this where you've got a patient who is stable, conscious, and um, alert. You want those things to be true to be seated in the car with no hazards, no life threats, then you can safely move him uh, with the short backboard or the vest. And that's probably going to be the answer in those cases as well, if you have a question like that. Number three, a two-year-old female has experienced a seizure. When you arrive at the scene, the child is conscious, crying, and clinging to her mother. Her skin is hot and moist. The mother tells you that the seizure lasted approximately five minutes. She further tells you that her daughter has no history of seizures, but has had a recent ear infection. What should you do? A, allow the mother to drive her daughter to the hospital. No, uh, that would not be the correct way to do this. 
in general, if you've been called out, at least for the test's sake, if you've been called out for um, any sort of emergency, you're going to transport. It's not going to be an option to have the parent transport or go to the doctor the next day or anything like that. B. Attempt cooling measures offer oxygen and transport. Potentially, yes. Uh, remember, this child has a fever. Her skin is hot and moist. What kind of seizure was this probably? Yeah, a febrile seizure, okay? Y'all remember that word? Basically meaning that it has to do with the, the fever that the child had. And I think we talked about this, how a fairly high number of children experience these when they're kids. There's no long-term uh, harm to the kid. It just it happens. So B would be good because it would help cool them down. Oxygen is appropriate for any patient, and transport is appropriate for any patient. C, place the child in cold water and to attempt to reduce her fever. No, that's not how we handle cooling somebody down. And D, suspect that the child has meningitis and transport at once. There's not really anything that points specifically to meningitis. If it's a question where meningitis is the correct answer, you're going to be seeing those really specific symptoms of like a stiff neck, fever, chills, kind of those flu-like symptoms. This, this stiffness in the neck is really the main one, that if it's in your question, they're asking about meningitis. Um, but there's nothing in here to really say meningitis specifically, so it's kind of jumping to conclusions. So the best answer choice here would be B. Cooling measures, oxygen, and transport, those are all appropriate for this patient. Number four, a 28-year-old male was struck in the chest with a baseball bat during an altercation. He is conscious and alert and complains of severe chest pain. Your assessment reveals a large area of ecchymosis over the sternum and a rapid irregular pulse. In addition to applying 100% oxygen, what should you do? Do you all know what ecchymosis means? Yeah, blood pooling under the skin. So it can look like a bruise or it can have more defined edges, but it's essentially that. Okay, so you've got this patient with a large bruise, um, blood pool under his skin over the sternum, a rapid irregular pulse, he was hit in the chest, so some sort of chest trauma. What do you need to do? Should you A, apply an AED and take his blood pressure? There's no indication that he needs an AED. He's conscious and alert, he's not having breathing problems. His pulse is rapid and irregular, but there's no indication that he's about to go into cardiac arrest. B, prepare for immediate transport. Yeah, that would be good. Transport is never going to be a bad thing to do for a patient. So that's always uh, worth considering. C, determine if he has cardiac problems. This is really, really vague. It's not talking, you don't know whether it's talking about a history of cardiac problems or cardiac problems right now. Um, it's not really going to answer your question because that has more to do with like a medical, I'm assuming, and probably more of a medical history side of things. And this is a trauma case. Like you're dealing with a specific event that caused a specific thing. It's not that it's bad to know if he has some sort of congenital defect, but it's not going to make a huge difference in terms of how you treat your patient. Or D, apply bulky dressings to the sternum. Not really. When we talk about bulky dressings, we're usually talking about um, trying to keep like ribs in place or something like that if you have broken ribs, or trying to stop bleeding, of course. And neither one of those is really happening here. That ecchymosis is under the skin. It's not coming through. It's not open at all. So in this case, transport is definitely the right choice. Number five. A 27-year-old male was stabbed in the chest during a disagreement at a poker game. As you approach him, you see that a knife is impaled in his chest. Before you make physical contact with the patient, it is most important to what? Look at these answer choices. The answer should be pretty obvious. C, adhere to BSI precautions. Remember, if you have an answer where this is kind of thing is going on and BSI is an answer, BSI is going to be the answer. It's the first thing you have to do in any scene, um, and it's always going to take precedence over all the other options. Number six. You are assessing a 30-year-old female who presents with respiratory distress and tachycardia after she opened a package that was delivered to her home. The patient tells you that there was a fine white powder on the package, but she didn't think anything of it. This patient has most likely been exposed to what? B, B anthrax. Uh, you're probably not going to get this type of question. I mean, you might get something similar to this, but really this specific situation is probably not your, something you're going to get tested on. Um, for one thing, you don't really know all that much about all the other things on here necessarily. Um, for another, the whole anthrax scare is a very much time-specific thing. Like when this test was written, anthrax was a big deal. You're not seeing people getting anthrax in the mail so much anymore, so it's not as topical. Wait, what is 
Okay, anthrax is, um, I guess, essentially a toxin that um, it can cause respiratory distress. It causes lesions, like black um, skin lesions. It, it is a white powder. Like, that's, that's what I'm saying. This is a very topical question because there was a big scare, I think, in the early 2000s. Um, people were sending packages... I don't even know if it happened that often, but it was a scare that people were sending packages with anthrax in them to, like, senators and government officials and stuff like that. There was a huge, like, crackdown on it. Um, we were talking about Criminal Minds. There's a Criminal Minds episode where um, they get exposed to anthrax and the guy has, like, light bulbs full of it that he's about to release in a subway and Reed gets exposed in the, um, in the laboratory. I don't know what it's called, but it's there. So. I guess that's the thing. I don't think you probably did because this is so topical. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you'd really expect to see on the test now. Um, Ebola is a bloodborne disease, and it is not not de like developed this way. Um, if you're exposed to somebody with Ebola and you catch it, you're probably going to die pretty quickly, and it's a very nasty death. Um, botulinum is a form of the toxin that people inject into their heads, like Botox, to make the muscles not wrinkle, um, and it is a muscle paralyzer, uh, but again, doesn't actually work in this manner. And neurotoxin, a, a neurotoxin is a very broad class of uh, toxins that can work on the body, that attack the nerves, the nervous system. Number seven, while assessing a 21-year-old female who struck a tree head-on with her small passenger car, you note that her airbag deployed. What should you do? A, perform a rapid trauma assessment while she is in the car. Yeah, not, not typically. Uh, maybe. It's kind of whatever. B, lift the airbag and look for deformity to the steering wheel. Um, I'll go ahead and answer. In, in this case, the answer is actually B. So this one is kind of a hard one when you're looking at it because none of these are really wrong. Um, what it's trying to get you to think about, though, is the mechanism of injury that's here. So, truck it, struck, excuse me, struck a tree head-on, and the airbag deployed. Um, what that's trying to make you think of is that there was a strong enough mechanism of injury that it may have caused real problems to her chest. In this case, they want you to look and see further what kind of mechanism of injury there was, or more detail about it. So, if the airbag has deployed, um, it's partially covering up the steering wheel. They want you to lift up the airbag or, or remove it somewhat from the steering wheel so you can see if the steering wheel is deformed at all. Because they, what they want to see, what they're trying to look at, is to see if there was hard impact between her chest and the steering wheel as well. Like the airbag may have deployed and caught most of the force. So you'd, if for an airbag, you'd expect to see a lot of, um, you know, maybe some overall chest bruising, maybe a little bit of like cuts on the hands or face, depending how that person was posed. Or if they had their hands up to protect themselves, you might see some um, kind of a friction burn type thing on the areas that it touches. But um, they may have also still had a hard enough impact that they would have hit the steering wheel. And that's a real concern because that steering wheel, if it slams into your chest, it's not giving. Your chest is going to give. Uh, you will probably see some signs of deformity to the wheel itself. So that's what they want you to think about checking for. Uh, because if that's the case, that hard impact to the chest, you're going to be expecting to see broken ribs, um, potentially like per, uh, pericardial tamponade, all kinds of things going on with the heart, with the lungs. So that's why you want to look for that mechanism of injury because that will help you see or um, think about what kinds of trauma you may need to look for in the patient. So that's why the answer here is B. Um, rapid trauma assessment isn't a bad idea. I mean, you do need to check for overall stuff when you're dealing with your patient. You should assess her upper chest for injuries, seatbelt related and otherwise. Remember what we'll probably see in a patient who has seatbelt injuries. You're probably going to honestly see a bruise across them, specifically on the hard parts like appear at the collarbone, uh, maybe a little bit on the abdomen, but mostly kind of that. And so when they say um, assessing her upper chest, they're saying to look for that bruising pattern. It's really distinctive because um, it can break bones along the way, but mostly it'll just be a bruise. And then you do want to extricate her, maybe not immediately. Um, you know, you want to take your time and be safe with it, um, deal with those life-threatening injuries, because obviously she struck a tree, she's going to have some spinal compromise. But anyway, in this, in this case, the answer that they want you to think about is B, because it's looking at other ways for that mechanism of injury to have caused problems for her. Does that make sense? Okay. Eight. Extrication is most accurately defined as... What? 
So in this case, the answer choice is C. You have to look at extrication and remember that there are multiple kinds. It's really just a general term. It doesn't mean that you're having to use heavy equipment or that it's really involved. It can be a very simple extrication, which is essentially just opening the window or the door and helping the person out of the car. So it can be very complex using the jaws of life and everything else. Um, but really, it's just getting them out. It doesn't specify any sort of particular method or tools that you'd have to use. Number nine, you are standing by at the scene of a hostage situation when the incident commander advises you that one of his personnel has been shot. The patient is lying supine in an open area and is not moving. As the SWAT team escorts you to the patient, what should you do? So when you're going out there to deal with this patient, are you in a dangerous situation? Yes. You're going out to a, a person who was just shot right where they landed. Um, that means that whoever is shooting could probably hit you too. So you do want to be incredibly careful. Now, since you are going out there, you're going to assume it's not this whole, like, stay in a safe place and wait. You're actually going to be helping your patient with something. Um, however, you want to stay out there as little as possible. Based on that, looking at these answer choices, which one will allow you to stay out there as little as possible? So... A, limit your initial assessment to airway and breathing only. Um, that is incomplete, I guess, for what it is, because initial assessment really should be airway breathing circulation. Um, so in that case, it's wrong because it's honestly, if, if you were going to assess him out there, you're not assessing enough. Does that make sense? B, treat only critical injuries before moving him to a safe place. Um, no. Treatment of critical injuries can be done when you're in a safe area. It's not going to make that big of a difference um, if that person is bleeding out. If that person is bleeding out and you stay out there to try to treat them and you get shot, now you're no longer keeping track of your own safety. So staying out there to actually treat something is going to be way too long. Um, it's not going to be safe at that point. C, grab them by the clothes and immediately move them to safety. Is this keeping yourself as safe as possible? Yes. Uh, and looking at D, perform a rapid trauma assessment and move him to a safe area. Yeah, it's, it's not that it's like a bad thing to do. Obviously, you are going to have to assess him properly and treat his injuries and things like that. Um, but performing a rapid assessment, even as rapid as it could be, is still going to be a minute, two minutes as you're standing out there trying to figure out what's going on with this patient. And you don't want to be out there for that long. Um, if he has... I mean, he was shot, so you're assuming probably that it's not going to be some sort of spinal compromise, so you don't really have to worry so much about that. But remember, even when you've got a patient who is in a car wreck and you have to move them quickly, you do the best you can, but frankly, you just move them. You know, they're, yeah, their spine might get more messed up than it was, but you have to move them so that you and the patient both are safe versus stay there and treat them. So in this case, C is the best answer. Um, you don't want to stay out there for any more time than you absolutely have to. Just grab them and go in a dangerous situation like this. 10. You are assessing a 27-year-old female who was ejected from her car when it struck a utility pole at a high rate of speed. She is unconscious and has slow, irregular breathing. Her blood pressure is 180 over 90, and her pulse rate is 50 beats per minute and bounding. The most appropriate treatment for this patient includes what? Okay, so I'm hearing most people say C. C is the correct answer. Good job. Um, why did you guys choose C? Okay, so slow regular breathing, good, means she needs actual assisted ventilation. It's not enough to just give her a non-rebreather. So because of that, you can definitely cancel out B. Um, you can also cancel out D, why? You never hyperventilate a patient at 40 breaths per minute. That's just completely wrong. Yeah, just regardless of what's happening to your patient, that's not going to be correct. So now you're between A and C. Um, you have a patient... Okay, so she was ejected from her car when it struck a utility pole. Do you think a short backboard is enough? No. no. So because of that, spinal immobilization, uh, fully on a long backboard, assisted ventilation with oxygen and rapid transport, you guys were right. The answer is C. Number 11. You have sealed an open chest wound on a 40-year-old male who was stabbed in the anterior chest. Your reassessment reveals that he is experiencing increasing respiratory distress and tachycardia and is developing cyanosis. What should you do? What is happening to this patient? Based on what this question is telling you, what can you assume? 
Okay, yeah. So to some degree, he's suffocating. He's developing cyanosis, so he's not getting enough oxygen. Um, what do we know about this guy's wound, how he was injured? Stabbed. stabbed in the anterior chest, which means the front chest wall. It's an open chest wound. So what is it likely that it hit? Heart or lungs. Okay. Do you remember what a pneumothorax is? Okay. Um, do you remember what a tension pneumothorax is? Yeah, so when we talk about pneumothorax, we're usually meaning more of the simple pneumothorax where it's just that like a lung is collapsed, and that can happen in people spontaneously. Um, tension pneumothorax is essentially where it is open, and a tension pneumothorax creates, usually anyway, creates a one-way valve in which uh, air cannot, like, it can't go in, but it can go, it, it, it's weird. Sorry, I'm not explaining it well. Basically what's happening to this patient is if you're ventilating him, air is going in, and then if there's, if there's a puncture in that lung, so it's going back out the puncture of the lung, and it's filling up inside the chest. But you've covered that chest wound from the outside, so air is filling up inside the chest com like repeatedly over and over and putting a lot of pressure inside because, like this is what I was trying to explain with the one-way valve, like air can go into the, like out of the lung, the lung is inside, it can go out of the lung, but it can't go back in. So when he's trying to breathe back out, the air is not going back up from that side. Did that make sense? I feel like I was really confusing when I said that. Sorry, not explaining it well. Um, don't worry about the one-way valve thing because I didn't explain that well. Basically, he was stabbed, the lung is punctured, so air is going in into the lung and then out into the chest, but it is not able to come back up because it's no longer in the lung. So when you're breathing out, it's just staying in the chest. It's not pushing back out. That part's clear? Okay. Now, because you have sealed this open chest wound, that means that there's nowhere for that air to go. We've said it can't go back out, so it's just staying there you would want to open it up somewhat because that will allow air to actually escape through the chest wound. Um, and in that way, there won't be as much pressure building up. If a patient doesn't have an opening in their chest, sometimes paramedics will actually um, stick a needle in, yeah, to get air out, to let air out so that pressure doesn't build up too much. This person already has a, you know, a built-in escape vent, basically, uh, but you've sealed it up. So what you'd want to do is partially remove the dressing. And they actually have dressings for this um, that are sealed on three sides so it can cover up the wound and make sure no air like sucks in from the outside, but it will allow air to escape through that third, uh, fourth side that's not closed off. So the answer is B. Sorry, guys. I, I know what I'm saying, and I just totally bumbled my words there when I was trying to explain that one. Number 12. A 56-year-old male has an incomplete avulsion to his right forearm. After controlling any bleeding from the wound, what should you do? What is an avulsion? Yeah, remember, an avulsion is a place where the skin has come up, or the skin and, the, like, the flesh right below it has come up partially from the muscles and, and bone underneath, but not completely ripped off. So it's essentially, it's a flap. Should you A, carefully probe the wound to determine if the bleeding is venous or arterial? No. For one thing, you don't need to probe the wound to figure that out. You should be able to tell by how it's bleeding, whether it's venous or arterial. What does an arterial bleed look like? Bright red, spurting blood, right? Venous bleed? Dark red, steady flow. B, carefully remove the avulsed flap and wrap it in a moist, sterile trauma dressing. You do not want to cut whatever flap is, cut it off and, and keep it separate. That's, ugh, that just doesn't appeal to me at all. Sounds terrible. C, replace the avulse flap to its original position and cover it with a sterile dressing. Yes, this is the correct answer. There's nothing bad about that. That's exactly what you would do. Um, just let's look at D. Thoroughly irrigate the wound with sterile water and cover it with a sterile dressing. You don't need to irrigate the wound. It's not your job to try to wash stuff away. Um, you just would bandage it up as it is. So C is the correct answer. 13. Which of the following statements regarding the incident command system, the ICS, is most correct? This is pretty much straight up a content question. It's very straightforward. The answer is B. So the incident command system is not just for any specific type of incident. It is really, it's a um, 
broadly defined system that's meant to just kind of give us a plan for how to deal with anything that happens. Usually we don't have to use the full thing, um, unless it's a mass casualty, mass casualty incident or something where you have a lot of patients. You typically don't have to have that full structure going on. And I don't, um, I don't know how much your book went into all this stuff, but it's, it's basically it's just a plan for who's in charge, who reports to who, how do we split up the, um, the job so that everything gets done, that kind of thing. Um, and it's not just for the EMS system. This is between law enforcement, federal um, systems, everything. It, they all use this system. It's all supposed to help everyone coordinate together. Number 14. When immobilizing the spine of an injured 79-year-old male with severe kyphosis, what should you do first? Y'all remember what kyphosis is? Yeah, I remember kyphosis is a spine that is um, hunched, kind of hunched forward, bent forward. However, for the sake of immobilizing a spine, the very first step should be the same regardless of your patient. What is that first step? D, manually stabilize the head. Um, you would assess distal functions, you would apply a cervical collar, assuming it would fit them properly, kind of that would depend on their particular bend. Um, you wouldn't necessarily need to pat under the head, but you could, just like with any patient, but you'd always, always, always manually stabilize. The whole thing of him having severe kyphosis is kind of like trying to get you off track and think differently, uh, or distract you from what you know to do for any patient. Number 15. Oh, excuse me, number 15 we're not going to do. It has to do with the process of intubating somebody, and that's far beyond our scope. So just ignore that one entirely. Number 16, you are transporting a patient with blunt abdominal trauma. The patient is unstable and is experiencing obvious signs and symptoms of shock. Your estimated time of arrival at the hospital is less than 10 minutes. After treating this patient appropriately, what should you do? Should you A, closely monitor him and reassess him frequently? Yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that answer. B, demin excuse me, begin documenting the call on the patient care form. If your patient is unstable and actively experiencing shock, do you think you should turn your, pa your, information or turn your attention away from him and start working on your forms and paperwork? No. Your job is for your patient. It's not to start doing your paperwork right then and there. It'd be one thing if your patient was completely stable, um, didn't really need any real attention from you, and you had more time. Then, yeah, you can go ahead and write some things down, but, um, but not in this case. C, perform a detailed head-to-toe physical examination. This patient we already know has blunt abdominal trauma. You've treated him appropriately, um, meaning that you would have already done what you had to do for the normal assessment for this patient. So performing another head-to-toe assessment is really not necessary. D, forego the hospital radio report because of his condition. So what this is saying is that because he's in such bad shape, you wouldn't bother to call into the hospital and explain what's happening. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. No. Um, if anything, you'd want to make sure to tell them as much as possible so they'd be really prepared. Uh, but just totally not saying something to them could cause a lot of problems. So the answer in this case is A, uh, monitoring him, reassessing him frequently. We know we do that for unstable patients, so that's what makes sense here. Oh, excuse me. Number 17, during your rapid trauma assessment of a 30-year-old male who fell 25 feet, you note crepitus when palpating his pelvis. Your partner advises you that the patient's blood pressure is 80 over 55, excuse me, 80 over 50, and his heart rate is 120 beats per minute and weak. After completing the rapid trauma assessment, what should you do? A, defer spinal immobilization and transport to a trauma center. Y'all know what defer means? It means like to delay it or put it off. Does that make sense here? No. No. If you suspect that a patient needs spinal immobilization, you take care of it. Um, putting it off wouldn't make sense. B, perform a focused physical exam with emphasis on the pelvis. You've already done somewhat of an exam, right? You've already um, noted crepitus when you palpate. You don't need to go back and palpate further to know what's going on. 
C. Stabilize the pelvis with the PASC and transport immediately. Who remembers what the PASG or the PASC is? Okay, nobody. It stands for pneumatic anti-shock garment. Okay, pneumatic starting with a P as in like having to do with air. Pneumatic anti-shock garment. It's essentially um, a big pair of inflatable trousers that you snap on around your patient or you use Velcro to snap on. And when you inflate it, it puts pressure on all the lower extremities up to about, I guess, the hip area. Um, and what that's supposed to do, put, by putting that pressure on the outside, it's putting pressure on everything that's in there, including the blood vessels, which means that they're constricting a little bit. If you've got those constricted blood vessels, what's happening to your blood pressure overall? It's going to go up. That's what happens. That's why you have high blood pressure. Um, if you have like chest pain and high blood pressure and we give you nitroglycerin, it, it opens those up, which drops your blood pressure. So it makes sense that by constricting blood vessels, it would raise your blood pressure. Um, so the PASC will do that to all the blood vessels down here, pushing blood essentially upwards towards the parts that really need it, pushing blood towards the heart, the brain, everything like that, hopefully raising the overall blood pressure. Uh, they're also very helpful in terms of trying to stabilize the pelvis. If the pelvis is broken and there's um, a lot of shock going on. Do y'all remember how much blood can be lost internally if a patient breaks their pelvis? It's two liters, actually. Yeah, um, this is probably something that you'd want to remember. If a, if a patient breaks one of, its, one of his or her femurs, they can lose up to one liter of blood internally into the surrounding tissues. Just all those blood vessels around it are broken, and the, the blood just kind of bleeds internally. Um, regardless of whether or not it's open to the air. If the pelvis breaks, it's up to two liters. So if you've got a patient with a broken pelvis and two broken femurs, how much have they lost? Up to, oh, up to four. Remember, one for each femur and then two for the pelvis. Yeah, so four, and they only have six total in their body. Um, it's a real concern. So stabilize the pelvis. If the pelvis is broken, you probably lost a lot of, a lot of blood. The pass pants will help kind of conserve what blood you do have, push... Uh, push in on the blood vessels, keep that blood pumping up in the upper, more important parts of your body. Obviously, with all the explanation I'm doing, the answer here is supposed to be C, because it helps you do both things, stabilize the pelvis and control for blood pressure. Um, you may have questions on the test where the PASC is, either it'll be one of the better answers, or it might be like a red herring, but you should at least know what it is, um, so you won't get confused about why it's popping up in your answer choices. Why is D wrong? Yeah, if you have a patient who has um, prepotus in their pelvis, so probably some degree of broken pelvis, you're not supposed to log roll them. What do we do to pick them up? We usually would use a scoop stretcher, yeah. Since that's not an answer choice, if there was an answer choice, you might have to do more thinking about it, but in that case, this isn't. In this case, it isn't an answer choice, so the answer is C. Number 18. After applying a dressing to an arterial bleed from the patient's arm, you notice that the dressing quickly becomes soaked with blood. What should you do? D. Yeah, this is, again, it's a basic content question. There's nothing really unusual about this. Just like with any patient who's bleeding through a dressing, you put more dressings over the wound. Remember, you don't take that dressing away and put a fresh one on. You just pack more on top of it. If that doesn't work, then what do you start to do? Tourniquet, yeah. 19 is also an intubation question that deals with specifically the process, so we're not going to talk about 19 at all. It's way outside our scope. And then we'll stop after 20 for a break. During your initial assessment of a semi-conscious 30-year-old female with closed head trauma, you note that she has slow, shallow breathing and a slow, bounding pulse. As your partner maintains manual inline stabilization of her head, what should you do? Should you A, perform a focused physical exam and thoroughly assess the patient's head? Does that answer the um, main parts of the question? No, because what's really happening with this patient? Like, what do you have to actually worry about with this patient? Yeah, so slow, shallow breathing is happening. Slow bounding pulse is also something you'd want to be concerned about. Um, doing just an exam and assessing the head doesn't answer either of those questions. So A is out. B, instruct him to assist ventilations as you perform a rapid trauma assessment. 
B is a good answer, right? Um, assisted ventilations are important. We already talked how those seem to be necessary. Rapid trauma assessment certainly isn't a bad thing. It's on the list of what you would do kind of towards the beginning of um, a trauma assessment for, or, or rather a patient who has experienced trauma, how you'd assess them. So that's, you know, it's a good answer. C, apply 100% oxygen via a non-rebreathing mask and obtain baseline vital signs. Why not? Yeah, because she has slow, shallow breathing. That non-rebreather is not going to be sufficient for her. D, immediately place her on a long backboard and prepare for rapid transport. Again, it, just like A, it's not answering what you've seen in the question. You've seen that breathing problem that you can fix. You can't fix this, you, excuse me, you cannot fix a slow bounding pulse. So it's a consideration, but it's not a treatment that you can do. You can fix ventilations. You can assist with ventilations, and you can make sure they have enough oxygen. So B is your best answer, because it's something definitive that you can do for this patient.